This is part two of the Cognitive Meta Theory Integrating Tessel and Christianity. In the first part, we looked at the relationship between neurology and the diagram of mental symmetry, and we briefly talked about the simple styles. We will now turn our attention to the relationship between the theory of mental symmetry and linguistics. Noam Chomsky introduced the idea of universal grammar, which suggests that language is hardwired into the brain. We suggest that it is possible to explain universal grammar in terms of the function of the different cognitive modules and how they interact. In other words, what is hardwired is not specific to language, but rather is the functioning of each of these cognitive modules which imposes a general form upon all types of information that is being interpreted. This is similar to Kant's idea that, we are, that the mind pre-filters information in terms of space and time. Kant looked at it as a philosophical limitation. Mental symmetry dis suggests that it is a description of how the mind is wired. Our information will come from Sloban's cognitive pre pre prerequisites for the development of grammar. Sloban looked at language development in the child, and he noticed that there are certain patterns that are common to language learning in many children in many languages. And we will use those patterns and compare them with the functioning of the different cognitive modules. We will also add a little bit of description on how each of the seven cognitive styles behaves in a language learning environment. Remember that perceiver, for example, can refer either to the perceiver part, the, the cognitive module that is present in all people, or it can re refer to the cognitive style that is conscious in perceiver thought. Looking first at teacher thought, I mentioned before that mercy thought uh, acquires emotional experiences from the external world. The raw material for teacher thought is words. And these, th this is the building block for abstract thought. So we're looking at phonemes, morphemes, and lexis. The teacher person lives in words. Words are very important to the teacher person, and this cannot be overstressed. Analytical thought, if you look, notice it is left hemisphere, it works with sequences, that is one thing after another. Again, Sloban talking about how, and this is obvious, that speech works with sequences. It is a sequence of words. One, words occur, one word occur, occurring after the end, hopefully after the other. I mentioned that teacher thought is emotional. Stating this more precisely, teacher emotion is based in order within complexity. This means that there must be many items, that's the complexity, and they must fit together in a uniform manner. That is the order. Think of it as a king and his subjects. If the king has no subjects, then there is no order within complexity. There is order, but not complexity. If the king has many subjects and they do not obey him, then there is complexity without order. The maximum teacher emotion comes when the, there, there is a king and he has many subjects who follow him, who obey him. Applying this to teacher thought, 
the teacher person is very concerned about using precisely the right words. He does not want to use a long set of words, that's complex speech, when he can find, he would rather find the specific word that means exactly what he wants to say, because that's generating order within complexity. Similarly, he likes to say a complicated concept in one sentence, because that is again an example of order within complexity. When you look at grammar acquisition in the child, Sloban mentions that one of the basic attributes is overgeneralization. The child will come up with a, formulate a rule of grammar, but then apply it too far in an overgeneralized way. And that's what happens in the mind. Teacher thought looks for a general theory, and as we will see later, perceiver thought then limits it by looking for counterexamples. Teacher thought hates exceptions to the rule because that violates order within complexity. It's an emotional reaction. And similarly, Sloban noted that uh, children learning grammar, um, they avoid exceptions to the rule. They, to as they assume that rules apply everywhere. The teacher person who is fairly rare, but the teacher person studying language wants grammar and vocabulary. He wants to know the rules. He wants to have a vast vocabulary so he can say everything using precisely the correct terms it's to speak efficiently. Moving on, the next mode, the next cognitive module, is, synth, is the server thought, which provides syntax. If you look at the server person, the server person likes to follow instructions. They're very good with recipes. Tell me what to do. Follow the plan. Here is what I need to do. Here are the set of instructions. I do A, B, C, D. Looking at speech, you find that teacher thought contains the raw words, the theories. However, what strings these theories together, these words together, is server thought, and that provides the syntax. Syntax is like a, you can think of it like an algebraic formula in which the specific teacher words are placed. And teacher thought is not stable. Words and theories can change. However, server thought with the sequences, the general sequences that do not change, that adds stability to words. You can see the effect, what server is doing, for example, when, when there is memorization. Memorization repeats the words, it adds server stability to the teacher raw elements. Because the server person works with sequences and looks for sequences that are stable and do not change, first, the server person is very good at copying, at watching what another person is doing and following and doing the same thing. Again, Sloban notices that the child will naturally copy word order. Notice how sequence is being copied. One byproduct of this is that the server person finds it difficult to change the order of a sequence. And if a certain recipe works, then the server person will tend to stick with that recipe. And like I mentioned, they tend to, server person tends to repeat sequences that works. And similarly, Sloban mentions that the child naturally avoids interrupting or rearranging linguistic units. So if it works, keep the order intact and don't change it. When you are doing actions or doing things in a certain sequence, 
then there will be a focus upon doing one thing at a time. Again, this is seen in the server person. They are not a normal, they are not a natural multitasker. Instead, it's you do one thing, you finish it, then you go on to the next thing, then you finish it. Uh, Sloban again notices that sentence structure, uh, the child naturally thinks of sentence structures as complete sentences or, or structures as complete entities so that this it think of it as a train with various cars arranged in the train one train is kept distinct mentally from the other train one sequence is mentally separate from another sequence so there you find server thought matching onto syntax this student the server person who learns a language actually enjoys the type of grammar exercises that are not currently approved of and that most people find boring because that provides practice. It gives the repetition to program server thought with syntax. Moving on now to the right hemisphere. We're dealing here with semantics, which is the meaning of words. Notice how our red arrow is going from teacher, the raw element with the words, to through server, which provides the syntax, provides the structure, the sequences within which the words are placed. And now we are going to map words with their meanings. If you look at the perceiver person, he thinks in terms of facts and connections. What happens is, in the same way that teacher words go to, are placed within server structure, notice the arrow that goes from teacher to server, so the raw elements of mercy experiences, individual experiences, are placed within perceiver categories. Again, notice the arrow going from mercy to perceiver. So perceiver does object recognition by placing experiences into categories. For example, categories of cars or categories of trees or categories of tables. The categorization is a nonverbal process. It is a visual way of finding common connections within be common elements, common facts between many different experiences and using those to categorize it. What happens is that object recognition then provides the meaning for words and phrases. Uh, Lakoff and Johnson talking about how meaning initially is acquired. You have the pattern recognition in perceiver thought that becomes linked to the syntax or the repeated words and sentences within server thought. That because the perceiver person lives in this meaning part, is conscious in this meaning part, he is very sensitive to hypocrisy. Hypocrisy is a mismatch between object recognition, going from mercy to perceiver, and meaning of word. The connection between perceiver and teacher server. Moving on, the perceiver person is very sensitive to double meanings, puns, and novel metaphors. This is what happens when a word or a sentence or phrase triggers several meanings in perceiver thought. For example, ship sinks that the ship could either be a noun or a verb, as could the sinks. So perceiver thought will notice both of these possible meanings. And that gives the perceiver person a natural ability to pun, to think of double meanings. I mentioned earlier that teacher thought 
naturally overgeneralizes. There is an emotional drive to find order, even when that order is not there. That's what's or go to go beyond what the order is. That's why it's overgeneralization. Perceiver thought limits the extent of overgeneralization. For example, suppose that it rained for the last few weeks, the last few weekends. Teacher thought will drive a person to come up with a general statement, it always rains on weekends. Perceiver thought then may think of two weeks ago, last Sunday, Sunday before last, when it was wonderful outside. And that counterexample will then limit the domain of the teacher theory, and so that teacher thought will be stopped from saying, it always rains. So this is also a general interaction that happens in thought. Teacher thought tends to come up with overgeneralization. Perceiver thought limits the domain by coming up with counterexamples. Looking at grammar, that's what Slobin said about grammar. Semantically consistent rules are acquired early. In other words, rules that fit into, that are natural, ones that are consistent with, that don't have hypocrisy, where there isn't a mismatch between your, your teacher theory. And those rules are easy to acquire by the mind, and then meaning will limit overgeneralization, as we have mentioned before. The perceiver thought is very good at figuring out, at guessing the meaning of what a person is saying when they are partially through their statement. It, this is jumping to conclusions. We will look at that this later. Linguistically, it's called implicature. And as a student, the perceiver person who is learning a language wants clarity and connections. The perceiver person, remember, ties together object recognition with meaning. Generally what happens is the perceiver person likes to have a general rule, but also wants to be given an illustration of how that rule works in real life. So it's a combination of general rule and example. The connections. When the perceiver person goes into a new context, he feels disoriented. And he has the, the, when the perceiver person has to gain associations, gain connections, gain facts to become oriented. It's like building up a map of the area. When you go to a new neighborhood and you have no map, you don't know where you are. You don't know where, where anything is. That's what happens with the perceiver person. So that's the connections, the clarity, so that the facts are clear. You know what the facts are. You know how everything relates together. Looking now at the second right hemisphere individual, this is the mercy person. Here we are dealing with pragmatics. Mercy person lives in a world of emotional experiences. Mercy part is an aspect of concrete thought. The world contains experiences. The physical body adds emotions to these experiences. And these emotional experiences are stored within mercy thought. Going further, the mind uses emotional experiences to represent people. Mercy thought thinks in terms of people. We will look at this more later on. So the teacher person likes theory, wants a general theory. Mercy person does not want just abstract theory. 
because the mercy person lives in experiences. So often the mercy person will ask, who are you talking about? They will assume that abstract theory is always referring to some person or involves some person. So what the mercy person wants is the personal illustrations, the examples. As I mentioned, personal identity resides within mercy thought. Teacher thought, this is left hemisphere, handles verbal communication. Mercy thought uses the analogous brain regions in the right hemisphere to produce and interpret nonverbal communication. Here we are dealing with accent and tone of voice. Teacher thought handles what is being said, the words. Mercy thought interprets how it is being said. Similarly, um, you notice the same distinction at different levels in speech. For example, you have consonants, which is a change in sound. That's teacher thought. Whereas vowels, mercy thought, that's a tone. Mercy thought is more attracted to singing, where the tone becomes a fundamental element of the speech. Whereas in normal speech, which focuses upon teacher words, the tone of voice adds secondary information and one ignores the tone at which one sings. Mercy person is also aware of politeness and sincerity. Politeness is caring for the person, not just simply stating something, but stating something in a way that indicates that the other person is valuable, that there's an emotional connection. The perceiver person we saw is very aware of hypocrisy. The mercy person, in contrast, notices sincerity and insincerity. A sincere person is broadcasting consistent nonverbal communication. Insincerity is when the nonverbal communication is inconsistent. When a person broadcasts one message, say with body language, or and a different inconsistent message, say with tone of voice. And the mercy person is very aware of this. Obviously, the mercy person who is studying a language wants illustrations that personalize, not just raw theory. Turning now to the three composite styles. I suggested earlier that the exhorter is a combination of teacher and mercy. We looked at teacher, server, mercy, perceiver, the four simple styles. These deal with content and these handle the various elements of linguistics. This is the structure and processing of the four simple styles is mostly responsible for Chomsky's universal grammar. The three composite styles use this structure to drive the mind. And so one does not find so much specific language here, but rather how it is used. If you look at the exhorter person, he is a great ad lib speaker. He is very good at talking on his feet. In fact, he has a harder time usually to stop talking than to start talking. He is very good at motivating others. Exhorter thought, um, as we will see, is as related to dopamine, the brain, the motivation, the, the neuromodulator that provides brain motivation. The exhorter working with emotion is very good at accessing the emotions of others, at triggering the others, the emotions of others, and using that to motivate people. Come on, hang in there, stick with it. You can do it, I know you can. It's followed by a friendly slap on the back. The exhorter 
linguistically can often be the instant expert. Yes, I know that that is a contradiction in terms, but not to the exhorter person, because we are looking at the overgeneralization of teacher person teacher thought, the personalization of mercy thought. The exhorter person, exhorter thought, works with these elements and uses these to provide the an overall direction, a flavor, a flow that catches the essence of what is being of, of what where a person wants to go. Using buzzwords so that the exhorter person tends to use words even when they are not properly defined because of the emotions that these words create. Exhorter person tends to exaggerate in contrast to the perceiver person who focuses upon facts. The, that is because the exhorter person sees what could be he is not looking primarily at reality, but he is overlaying imagination on top of reality. Exhorter part is the part of the mind that provides imagination for the mind by looking at how much better things could be or how much worse things could be. Therefore, this exaggeration, it's, it's the potential. It's, it's not lying. It's simply seeing how an extrapolation. I mentioned dopamine. Dopamine is related to all forms of addiction. That's what neurology tells us. The exhorter person hates being bored. Bored means that there is nothing emotional to drive to provide a source for motivation. Notice how exhorter is based upon teacher and mercy. Teacher contains general theories, which are emotional. Mercy contains emotional experiences, images of people. Those are also emotional. That provides the raw material for exhorter thought, which then generates excitement. If there is no raw material, then the exhorter person, the exhorter part, will become bored. Frustration is when one is looking for the next step, but one cannot reach it when it is not possible to turn imagination into reality. That provides frustration for the exhorter person, and the exhorter person really dislikes being frustrated. Addiction, again, you find the exhorter person is, will focus on the best, the most important, the most exciting, and then follow that with complete enthusiasm. As a student, the exhorter student who is studying language wants variety and excitement. And if this variety and excitement is not being provided by the teacher, then the exhorter student will provide, will himself or herself provide this excitement and become the center of attention for the class, obviously detracting from the teacher. Moving on to the contributor. Notice the error, arrow, <laughs> the arrow from exhorter to contributor. Exhorter provides the first step, excitement. Contributor thought takes this excitement and adds details to it, adds content to the initial, uh, the initial idea. So. Between exhorter and contributor, think of it as a rider on a horse. The horse is the exhorter. The horse wants to f is attracted to grass, food. So you have the exhorter wants some excitement, something that will attract motivation, whereas the contributor is like the rider on the horse. If there is no energy for exhorter, then the contributor will not feel the drive to go anywhere. That's why the contributor person is good at learning languages if motivated. There has to be some sort of bottom line, some sort of reason, something that attracts the attention, something emotional that attracts the attention of subconscious 
exhorter thought. Remember, in the contributor person, exhorter thought would be subconscious. Another reason that the contributor person is good at learning languages, we mentioned earlier when looking at the perceiver person, that meaning emerges when server syntax is connected with perceiver object recognition. Contributor thought does this actual connecting. And so the contributor person potentially is the best at learning language. The exhorter person is good at ad lib speech. In contrast, the contributor person prefers the lecture method to sit down and, and talk. The contributor person is not naturally good at free flowing lecturing, free, sorry, free flowing verbal interaction, bec but they can learn how to do it. It's, a, it's an acquired skill. A lecture is fine for the contributor person because there is a control there. There is not a, um, a law. It's everything is, you know where you are going. The contributor person is skilled at reasoning and logic. We will look at this later when we discuss technical thought. Technical thought is guided by contributor thought and combines server sequences with perceiver facts. Again, remember this. We will look at this later. Contributor person hates failure. And this is a very strong motivation. I mentioned that the contributor person is good at doing something if motivated. Part of that motivation is this desire, strong desire to avoid failing, wants to be a success. Living on the edge. Again, this relates to the horse and the rider on the horse. If the contributor person is away from the edge, then there is no exhorter excitement. There has to be something that attracts, that gives motivation to exhorter thought. And one common way of gaining that motivation is by living on the edge of excitement, the edge of disaster, the something emotional, that is something exciting that is within reach. But the contributor person, like the rider on the horse, does not want to fall off the horse. That's losing control. And so you see this, con this interaction between confidence and emotion. The m emotion is needed to provide motivation, but the confidence does not want to lose control to the emotion. So that's living on the edge, not over the edge, but on the edge. Technical thought, as I mentioned, that is what emerges when contributor thought takes control of the mind. You're dealing there, one is dealing there with rules of the game. A game is a limited realm and there are specific rules. One knows exactly what one will do, one knows what the facts are. And as a student, the contributor person is compat competitive. What are the rules of the game? I want to be a winner. How can I get good marks? What can I do to win? So there, you need a structure for that. Unlike the exhorter who wants the excitement, the contributor person wants a structure so that he can excel. He wants to know what the rules are. Looking now at the final cognitive style, the facilitator, notice the arrow that goes from exhorter to contributor to facilitator. Exhorter provides the initial idea, the excitement. Contributor turns this into a plan by adding facts from perceiver thought and actions from server thought. Facilitator th mode can facilitator thought, then blends, uses analog thinking, uses mixing to uh, create a flow out of the plan that comes from contributor thought. So I need to emphasize this. Facilitator thought thinks in terms of analog, in terms of grays, not black and white. 
the immature perceiver person tends to think in terms of black and white. For the facilitator person, gray is everything can be adjusted. However, this adjustment occurs within a structure. So, in the right hemisphere, perceiver thought provides the categories, the object recognition, and then, for example, here is a category of trees. Mercy thought would contain all the individual experiences. For example, evergreen tree, a bush, a pine tree, a cedar tree. So you have all these specific experiences. That combination of perceiver category filled with mercy experiences, that provides the raw material for facilitator thought. So facilitator thought will be guided by a perceiver category and then will adjust between the various mercy experiences within that category. Similarly, in the left hemisphere, the server sequences of syntax, of general structure, provide the stability and then facilitator thought will adjust the specific words and linguistic elements that come from teacher thought to provide flexibility. So, summing up, the, per the facilitator person wants to adjust within structure. If there is no structure, then the facilitator person will feel muddled because there is no stability. If there is structure but there is no flexibility within the structure, then the facilitator person will feel restricted. And so the facil facilitator naturally avoids routine where there is no flexibility. One byproduct of this, the facilitator person looking at the mind from the side, observing from the edge. The, pers the facilitator person needs to know the mental context, which comes either from perceiver facts or server sequences that provides the context. And then within that context, the facilitator person is aware of essentially everything. All sorts of ideas, all sorts of sequences, all sorts of sensory input, and that's where the blending occurs. It occurs with all the specific elements that occur within a certain mental context. But if the facilitator person does not know what the context is, then he can feel muddled or confused. So and again, knowing everything within a context. Facilitator thinking you is similar to statistical mathematics. Statistics does two things. First of all, it takes the information and it averages it in a gray manner, in a, uh, a blending manner. That's facilitator thought. It's the, all the information is averaged and blended. However, the second thing is, if information is too far from the norm, if it is extreme, then it will be removed and an, as an outlier. The facilitator person thinks that way. Everyone that is within the context, the accepted context, will be blended. That forms the reasonableness. That forms the consensus. But an extreme person will be rejected his ideas will be rejected as extreme, as outliers. Those do not form part of the synthesis. With speech as well, there is a cleansing, a filtering. If emotions are too strong, with, if words become emotionally colored too strong, then there is this, again, this extreme and so the facilitator will get rid of those words, cleanse them, come up with new euphemisms that contain less emotional content. This statistical thinking of averaging what is intuitive and then removing outliers as counterintuitive, that type of thinking will come up when we look at CSR.
the, which is the cognitive science of religion. Learning language, this student, the facilitator person, wants incremental progress. There must be progress, that's the blending, but it must be incremental, it must be evolutionary, it must be gradually changing. If there's too much of a change, then, there, then the facilitator person feels muddled. If there is no change, then the facilitator person wants to avoid the routine. Looking now at the brain, we saw previously that the four simple styles relate to the cortex. The three composite styles use this cortical information. They access the same memory, but as far as I can tell, they do not live in this memory. It's for example. The, the simple styles, they are surrounded by information, whereas the, cogn uh, the composite styles use the information. And the thinking, the processing of the, cogn of the composite styles occurs in a loop that goes through the basal ganglia, through the thalamus, and back to the cortex. So cortex to basal ganglia, which is striatum and globus pallidus and substan uh, substantia nigra, through thalamus back to cortex. The basal ganglia, uh, research has shown that there is a direct path and an indirect path. The direct path is related to dopamine. Dopamine enhances the direct path through the D1 receptors. Dopamine suppresses the indirect path through the D2 receptors. So you can see that same interaction between exhorter and contributor, between the horse and the rider on the horse. It's occurring in the basal ganglia. And then the thalamus is it takes the information from the basal ganglia, but it also adjusts information from the entire cortex and also information from the senses and balances and mixes between this information precisely how facilitator thought functions. Interestingly, there is one sense, smell, the sense of smell does not go through the thalamus. Instead, it goes directly to the orbital frontal cortex. In other words, smell affects our personal identity, orbital frontal related to internal world of mercy and teacher, and affects it on a very, in a very direct way that is unfiltered. So odor, smell, is a, it can bring up a mental context, bring up emotional experiences very efficiently.